Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our book launch. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Uh, my name's Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, very excited that we're launching new poetries this evening. Um, this is the first new poetries launch. Uh, we're doing five launch events between now and March 18th. So there's uh, four more events after tonight. Um, I'm very excited to get going with this. We've been um, working on new poetries for absolutely ages. So it's really exciting that we're gonna hear from the contributors um, finally. Uh, so just gonna run over some things before we get going. Um, anyone who was expecting to hear from Chad Campbell tonight, um, he, I know he was advertised on the lineup. Um, we had a little reshuffle and he is actually reading on March 18th now. Um, but if you go to the website, you can look at all the events, um, all the, the lineups and the booking links and everything is there for you um, if you go and check out the website. So um, this evening, what's going to happen, um, both our editors are here, uh, John McAuliffe and Michael Schmidt are both here and we've got four contributors with us. Um, so tonight we're going to have readings from Parwan Fia, Joseph Minden, Jennifer Edgecombe and Jenny King. Um, before I hand over to Michael, um, who is going to introduce the book and say a couple of words, I just want to point some things out to you. Um, You've probably realised already, but um, we can't see you and you can't turn your cameras on, actually. Um, so please do find the chat box. Um, say hello to us. We'd really like to hear from you throughout the event. Um, get involved with the conversation. Uh, let us know what you think of the poets and the, the reading this evening. Um, just say hello in the chat there for us. Um, so tonight, it's probably going to last just over an hour. Um, as I said, I'm going to hand over to Michael in a second, and then we're going to have the readings. Um, each contributor will be introduced in turn by one of the editors. Um, now, during the readings, I'm going to show the text on screen. It'll hopefully make it a bit easier for you to follow along uh, with the poetry. If you do want to see the reader a bit bigger, you should be able to sort of reconfigure your own screen. So try like double clicking on their face or like dragging the corners of the box. Um, if you've got any problems, put them in the chat and we'll try and help you there. Uh, so after we've had all four readings, we are going to have some group discussion. Um, there's also a Q&A box. Please, like, if you can find that, pop some questions in there for the readers later. Um, John and Michael will be able to put them to the contributors. And, we, and we, yeah, we want to get you involved in this conversation as much as possible, even if we can't see your lovely faces right now. Um, so I have put it in the chat already, um, but here's the info to buy the book with the discount code. That'll come as an email as well tomorrow. Just get in touch with me if you can't find it or if it hasn't come through or anything like that. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Michael, who's going to introduce the book for us and we'll get going. It's really nice of Jazz to do this again. She's such a, a wizard at uh, making these things happen. And it's a real joy to be here to celebrate uh, 27 years after the very first New Poetries um, and eighth New Poetries. In the first New Poetries, um, one of the poets was a, a writer called Sophie Hanna, who's become a very successful mystery writer. She's also a, do, writes Poirot in her spare time. Um, and uh, also we had a, a poet called Miles Champion, who was um, a very strange experimental poet whose work I always learn from and uh, I continue to learn from. He's, he's a really wonderful poet. There were others as well, poets from South Africa, poets from Ireland and so on. It was a very varied book, but there were only eight poets in it. And in this latest uh, number, we have 24 poets, uh, as, as though talent um, was increasing exponentially. Um, and both Sophie and uh, Miles were, were students of mine. It's very interesting how you come across poets. Uh, in tonight's spread, for example, I met Parwana and Joseph when I was in Cambridge as a teaching uh, fellow. And then I, I met uh, Jenny really had a reading that she gave and I was quite dazzled by her performance and by her poems and Jennifer sent poems to PN Review and this is how we build up as it were a publishing stable. Having added uh, John to uh, the, the as it were the masthead he is my associate publisher now uh, of course you would expect the numbers to go up because he had his enthusiasms and I had mine and we decided to respect one another's enthusiasms. And um, it's a joy having him on board as well. So it's a it's a wonderful um, shared uh, a shared responsibility. Well, I'd like now to hand over to um, to John, who's going to in, to introduce our very first poet. And I will. Um, okay, John, over to you. Can you turn yourself on? Hello, um, everybody. Thank you, Michael. Um, and it's such a pleasure um, having spent uh, 
as, as Jazz said, uh, nearly two years, I think, um, reading work um, and soliciting some of the work um, to make this book, um, which um, Andrew um, designed so beautifully here at Parknet, Andrew Latimer. Um, and it's so exciting for me to read the poems alongside one another, having had all of these um, separate conversations with Michael about the work that was coming in and um, from poets we knew and from poets that we, um, who we did not know at all. I first heard our first speaker tonight, um, Parawana Fayaz, read in the South Bank Centre on the night of the Forward Prizes um, last, last year, two years ago now. That night, she read her poem, 40 Names, and held uh, that packed house spellbound. And that poem begins, Zib was young, youth was all she cared for. It felt like we were hearing news, a report from one of those places, Afghanistan, which has been so close to the headlines for decades. But this offered another way into that world, some way which did not say what happened, but found a kind of sense in it, somehow conjuring a fable. And I think fable is the right word for the defining quality of Parawana's poems, which somehow account for what is happening there um, but also imagine a future uh, beyond um, our present moment. Reading Parawana's poems for the anthology, I had the same experience time and again um, that I had on hearing that poem for the first time. Um, Parawana's ambition for her poems is unusual, or it seems unusual to me. But then I learned that she had studied with um, Ivan Boland at Stanford. And there's something of Ivan's example in the uh, the plainness of the language in its lyricism um, and its attachment to the idea that poetry can speak back to national narratives, which I also recognize um, in both of their work. Um, Parawana's studies have brought her to the UK where she has studied at Cambridge for a number of years. She got her PhD in per Persian studies uh, last year and has just taken up a junior research fellowship at Peterhouse College. Um, and it's from there she joins us tonight. So I'm going to hand over to our first poet to read um, from New Poetries tonight. Please welcome Parawana. Oh, thank you so much, John, for that, for that wonderful introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, and it's, it's such a great honor to be here and reading for you. So the poems that I'm um, going to read tonight are three poems. Um, and the first poem is called uh, my grandmother's ruby ring, which you have on your screen. Um, and this first poem, as the name indicates really, it's about my grandmother's ruby ring. And um, the ruby ring has a very significant in our culture, first of all, because of its color, and second of all, it's because it's ruby. The mineral itself has been considered to be pure and has an essence that carries its purity forever. And um, this poem uh, really designates some woman's relationship with her ring. Um, so I hope it reaches to you the way I've written it, really. My grandmother's ruby ring. My grandmother wears a deep red ring, a ruby three set into a silver plate. She lives in the valleys, an orphan girl herding her sheep in the fields, a virgin not yet menstruating she became the bride for another orphan. A ring was given to her in a man's name. She was taken away. She became a wife and lived in the city, caring for the men, her four brothers, his, sis, his four sisters, and their sad stories. Seasons passed by, hardships. She was separated from her husband and went to live with her with her three boys and their families. Throughout her separation, she had always dreamed about her husband sitting under the shade of the apricot trees or watering the tomato plants in the garden. She was the Laikha and he, Yusuf. He always, she always referred to him as the prophet in her dreams. She does not complain about the wounds on her hands, a mother-in-law, a grandmother, and gradually she became a great grandmother. She had never shed a tear over the shattering clay roofs under the snowfalls. 
Now her story is about an old woman waiting for death. The rain goes to the one who washes her body. Only the woman who washes her well, dresses her properly, and pays respect to her body will inherit her ring. The second poem that I'm about to read is called In Search of a Woman. This poem is really inspired by my, my every summer visit to home in Kabul, where I all, always see this women moving in, in, in public spaces. And you rarely see their, their engagement the same way that you would, you know, you would see them being in their private spaces. Women are different in, in, in public. So here I am observing them and their daily chores, doing things that everyone really does. And, and, but, but they are unknown, unknown. they're unseen. Um, so I hope it, it really communicates that. In search of a woman, one. As morning melody breaks, the city breathes in the middle of some dry dust. Street vendors start by the river selling all kinds of drugs for the city. This opaque people smoking hashish. It's once blue river twisted through the city. It is now a broken river. Its banks darkened by trash of all kinds. Two, once after midday prayers, women headed to the city's river to wash their clothes rubbing and pounding them on its stones, crossing the blue carpet of the river. Above off was the turquoise, a mirror, an immortal soul of the city. Three. Now, after midday, this riverbank is home for this opaque people. As the Maghrib sunset fades out, these men head to the mosques. Four. I search in the streets of Kabul for a woman. And instead of writing poetry, search for her inside and outside of each room. Where could she be at this time of the day? Five. Kabul then sleeps. From the window of my house, I remain in a room filled with women and children. The odor of their clothes the smell of the children, over and over, the door is locked. Looking for a transcendence to emerge or a memory to reside, each day is the same day. I continue to write a poem. Well, the last poem that I'm about to read is called Quarantine. As the name indicates, it was inspired by the first few weeks of the first quarantine, uh, first lockdown here in, in, in the UK and how it really felt such a strange moment to be because I, my family live in five different continents and we were separated and we couldn't meet up that summer that we were supposed to. So this poem, I really imagined us coming together through language, through this common emotions that we shared over Zoom calls and talking over texts. So I wrote this poem in honoring that how much, no matter how much we're far away, we're gonna come back together. Quarantine. In the slowest pace of the unknown times, my father's hand caresses his headless cell phone. He wakes me to tell me times are uncertain the legless virus is deadly. His words in the invisible wire reach me between love and worry. In summary, he says, take care of yourself. Through the sunless sky, his flawless voice echoes, clear memories from wartime, stuck in the basement, a father and his daughter are laying, foreheads on the ground. My arms fall restless on the chair, or perhaps they're losing their pleasure of pain to months, like raw salmon served cold. The only visitor from home comes in its best attire, the moon in ivory color. I appeal, I pray, at least the pregnant Venice should change its color, 
perhaps too red. The night does not listen to me, nor to the owl that has taken up a room on my bed. I too bore it in its stuffed skin. The longer the night gets, the less superior the moon, I and the owl become. The only visible color is the color of dark against the dark. The veins on my wrists are now vessels and with throbbing as if they are listening to my heartbeats from behind my ears. My sleepy hands are changing shape, shapes. No dolls, no paws. The soles of my feet are rupturing. I feel the invisible water flowing in circle and circles for continents maps the entirety of my body. I am either an earless star or some mud dirt soon to meet the water. I find ways to rethink about the situation. I recongregate my brothers, brothers and sisters, my mother and my father from the far, far corners of the world. I am the tongue, the other, the ear, the other, the mouth the other the eye, the other the neck, the others the heart, the brain, the right arm, the left, the right leg, the left. Like an ocean, we swim to one another. As members, we meet again. One by one, we are wholesome again and fall and rise and rise and fall. Like a gentle touch, like a slow heartbeat in the moment, a blow kiss, I tell him. Grapes will be sweeter in September and we will go to north of Kabul with my sisters and brothers. Thank you, Parwana. Um, and really terrific to hear those poems um, tonight. Um, our, next, uh, our next poet um, is Joseph Minden. And uh, Joseph had, had, had actually previously published um, a pamphlet and a, and a verse fairy tale. Um, but his poems, when um, I first read them, I knew immediately that they had to be in the anthology. They were quite early in the process um, and they immediately um, spoke to me. They deal with um, very tough subject matter, um, the way that they engage with history. Um, Joseph had previously worked, I know, in the museum sector um, and had an awareness of the ways in which heritage um, and museums um, work um, in this country. But he wears all of that incredibly lightly uh, in the poems. Formally, um, he works really brilliantly with refrain, as I think you're going to hear, and the poems almost seem to re reincarnate um, other times and other lives as they move um, from section to section. In New York, um, uh, he writes in Family Tree, I was the eyeballs of my great uncle George, selecting books to spread free market seed in the USSR, the best the West could offer, how to fit freedom in a suitcase. And it's that tone which is wry and curious about the places that the poems seem to find themselves in, um, and the way that the poems try out voices, um, which I found so engaging and so already achieved um, in the poems um, that you're going to read in this anthology and that we're, we're now going to hear um, read by Joseph. Joseph is joining us from Brighton, um, where he moved um, around the time that the anthology was coming together, um, where he's training as a, uh, retraining as a secondary school teacher. So I'm looking forward now to hearing um, Joseph read these poems for the first time. Hello, everyone. Sorry, I'm sort of uh, cope, coping with the kind of trauma of trying to teach, learn how to teach on um, Zoom on Microsoft Teams. So when the little notification telling me to unmute appeared, I had a panic attack. I didn't know if I'd do it properly. So I hope you can hear me. Um, John just gave, um, I'd written a little introduction to explain, explain myself, but John's very wonderfully done it. Thank you, John, for that, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, Pana, for that wonderful reading. Um, I'm just going to read read these poems. Um, the first uh, one is I'm just going to read the first stanza of um, this one from fam uh, from Family Tree. 
in Vlad Dracul's veins, from whom great uncle George claimed our descent, my blood beat heavily. Outside, a new forest of Ottomans. I woke that weight overnight on my breastbone. Some force had made camp. Now they were impaled in the past. I harbored but the dullest under sun, like a weak pulse of bloodlust. Nosferatu. Odors are how interiors make themselves known to the world. My father lost his sense of smell when, or was it because, he stepped onto the sea at Horumersiel Shelley, believed to Ferianort, which is near Vangerland, and it was so frozen, nothing could be smelt. The sea and the sky, which went on forever, hummed like a freezer, and underneath was a body of water, alive and populated, over which the creaking of his steps extended like shadows of fingers across the lawn in the park on a summer's day. Long fingers, much longer than normal human fingers. He still carries the Nordsee, the Iceland that it was, in his nose. Everything remains in place, as though it is a plastic version and has no interior. He knows a world passes him by, invisible supplicant holding cups of the liquor of itself, fermented seaweed, mown grass, rose water, crude oil, up to the oblivious hood of his nose. And he loves the shapes of things, what the mummelica, the dyed egg, the plum brandy implies. Um, so I've just realized I can read from the screen, much less stressful. I said, yeah. Okay. From Say Road Cemetery Number no. Two. So, Say Road no Cemetery Number no. Two is a much um, larger poem, um, a kind of collage poem, um, which starts the, um, the, 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 the book from which these poems come um, and is the, the way I've tried in the larger poem to introduce the subject of the of of the war's memorialization in 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 this country and the, the deeply disturbing and problematic ways that i think it is memorialized and held in memory and um this is a, a section uh, a short section of that kind of collage poem uh, from say road cemetery number two i lost myself and found a field of poppies lanced for gum for milky languid tears, the yield of soft somniferum. And standing in the field were two whom poppies comforted. It was Maria Logan who began to speak. She said, be mine the balm whose sovereign power can still the throb of pain, the produce of the scentless flower that strews in the stand's plain. Then Sarah Coleridge spoke up, compelled to talk in turn about the nullifying cup that terminates concern. When poor mamma long restless lies, she drinks the poppy's juice. That liquor soon can close her eyes and slumber soon produce. Oh, then my sweet, my happy boy will thank the poppy flower, which brings the sleep to dear mamma at midnight's darksome hour. The poppies stretched out row on row, as far as I could see, and both the women turned to go without noticing. Gurney Drive, Penang. 
There was an outdoor gym near the pier. We went there. Did we have an argument? I can't remember why we went. Were we speaking? I can't hear anything. All there is, is the gym gear and us standing there, present but absent. Two reeds from the opium dependent fens. A hallucination from Grasmere. I saw sailors moving around as though it were a film set. It was a film set. I put on my frock coat and turned to go. The ship was sailing shortly. UNESCO hovered in the present like a sunset, over the future like a UFO. Inheritance. Odors are how interiors make themselves known to the world. My father lost his sense of smell when? Or was it because? I know none of this firsthand, but I've pieced together what I can from moments when clues have offered themselves discreetly. There, the smell of fresh laundry. In this way, I discovered how my grandfather died, failing to fix a simple problem with the radio, saying he had not seen the figure by the window. I'm an idiot. The words rose quietly heaven, a speech scroll, and he fell towards the surface of the earth, dead to the passing pageant of fragrances from his childhood in another country. Every Easter, my father takes eggs, ties string around their shells, and boils them with onion skins so that the boiled egg emerges dyed, dressed in wild red and pale crucifixes. You take one, I take the other. I smash your egg with the nose of mine and its crown crumples, releasing the scent. I had said something, the Easter acclamation in a distant language. Truly, he is risen, is the reply. An echo through a veranda in the hills above Cebu. In truth, he was never dead. Thank you very much, Joseph, for that. <clears throat> it's my pleasure to um, introduce Jennifer now. Um, Jennifer comes from my favorite shire, the Dushy Shire of Cornwall. And when she first sent her poems to PN Review, um, I recognized the landscape, the landscape of Brian Winter, Peter Lanyon, the tin mines and so on, but uh, especially the sea. And uh, the spirit of late W.S. Graham seemed to, um, seemed to hover over the poems. The poem that immediately ravished me, and when you're an editor, when you find your lips moving as you read a poem, uh, you know that you're onto something either terribly bad or really rather wonderful, was a poem called The Waverley. Uh, and um, it's a poem which when she came to Manchester to launch the PN Review in which it appeared, she read, and I was perfectly persuaded that I had not made an error in publishing it. Um, other poems uh, also evoke the landscape. <clears throat> and I think the vividness of the evocation is partly due to the fact that having lived in Cornwall and having loved Cornwall, she left and now lives in Kent, a very different sea, a, different, a very different landscape. And there is this very strong, uh, not nostalgia, uh, hunger, something much deeper than nostalgia for a landscape which was never, <clears throat> was never easy, but was always very much alive for her in a way that later landscapes perhaps have not been. Um, the language that she uses uh, is quite plain. It doesn't, uh, as it were, aspire to poeticism. She makes her poems out of, um, out of speech and uh, her forms, though they are relatively strict, are also quite, um, quite free. They're stri strict in the sense that uh, they're, they're stanzaically strict and they do have wonderful patterning in them but they're not, she doesn't normally um, rhyme uh, or meter her poems. Um, there's something very natural about them and there's something like a dialogue going on. There's a wonderful moment in the Waverley where she speaks about the passengers on the, on, the, on the boat photographed us and we photographed them. There's this kind of reciprocity as we look, as we look at the poem and the experiencing of the poem and, uh, and the poem looks at us. Um, I think she's a, a wonderful poet and a very natural poet and it's a joy to introduce her here.
Thank you very much, Michael. And thank you to everyone at Car Connect and uh, to Jasmine for putting this event together. Um, as Michael said, I write a lot about Cornwall and the sea. Um, and I suppose I am quite fluid in that aspect. Um, some of these poems are about Cornwall and the sea, um, and some of them aren't. The first one that I'm going to read is called Lloyd's List. And it's about the bell that uh, was salvaged from the HMS Lutine. And it's used to be rung at Lloyd's Insurers in London after each shipwreck. Lloyd's List. The bell recovered from HMS Lutine used to be rung at Lloyd's. Twice for a safe arrival, once if the ship had gone down. Toll after toll has breached the bell, the crack a widening silence. But the lost book continues to lengthen with a carefully inked quill. Uh, the bell isn't actually rung anymore, as I mentioned in the poem, because it's quite fragile. Uh, but it was rung recently uh, during the pandemic when the office had to close for the first time due to lockdown. Uh, the next poem is about various forms of water. It's also about forms of life. And it's also after a painting. It's called Brian Winter's Landscape Zenner. The dark is the sea that has soaked through, dripping into buckets already full, nighttime in the day. The granite blackened, the fields dimmed, the moon in each headlight. With each stroke of the paddle, you try to keep time with the sea the blue pulling you deeper into the undertow. In the gallery, my small body of water rests in front of your canoe, your final form unmoored. The next poem I'm going to read is a longer one and it's called The Penley Lifeboat Disaster. Well, they're mostly fishermen. They come from the same village as what I do. This is just a part-time job. I'm pretty lucky here. The sons of Mausel, top notch. Darts had just started. Everyone was drinking, laughing, joking. A strange note in the wind. I asked him when he'll be round the corner we call Land's End the corner. He said about just after tea. He said it was rolling a bit, a marker on the radar, slowly drifting in towards land. When the maroons were heard, stop what they were doing, rush to the station, only eight hands were needed. All dressed, the best he had, just sort of waited, waited and waited, and waited to catch the right moment to knock her off the slope. She went down and was gone. Some 30 foot in height, like being in a washing machine, bouncing significantly, the ocean was very confused. A mother, two children, eight miles east of Wolf Rock, together for Christmas, engines have stopped, about 50 foot seas. With water in the fuel tank, he was drifting faster than he thought. It was getting very difficult, less than a mile from shore. 60, maybe 70 foot waves. How very clean and new the green painted deck looked. Extraordinary screaming, bright pink court shoes. The Union Star was on her maiden voyage. The Union Star was the latest one. With the Union Star so close to shore, Union Star was heading straight toward. I could see the helicopter and I could see the Union Star. Water getting into the engine of the Union Star. Solomon Brown went up onto the Union Star, but after sliding off the deck of the Union Star, she was effectively out of the water. Two boxing bags, trying to steady themselves, throwing lines over, 
shadows of people running. It appeared they were just jumping. And the lifeboat crew were out with their arms out. He always seemed to be a free spirit, like a breath of air. She went out and she's still out. Uh, the next poem is called From the Balcony, and it's a, a lockdown poem. From the balcony, I remove sticks and feathers. The compost around my bush tomatoes, a new home for a pair of collared doves, limp leaves, a snapped stem. They return to try the balcony above, wings whistling as they rise. Flares launching from a stricken boat. My last poem takes us from the sea to the city, 40 years ago, and it's called Dad's Commute. He would leave his desk at 5.15 and clock out on the next three minute decimal, walk his normal pace to New Street, where the train would be waiting. He'd walk to the end of the platform because no one else would go down that far. And slamming the door shut behind him, he'd sit and take his shoes off, reach up behind his shoulders to turn the carriage lights off and watch the orange fireworks of the ironworks across Birmingham. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was a wonderful reading. And um, I particularly liked your balcony with your collared doves. I call my collared dove a pigeon called Humphrey, but um, I recognize the scene vividly. When I went to uh, Sheffield for a reading at the poetry business, um, I heard Jenny King read for the first time. And coming home from her reading, um, armed with her two pamphlets, which I particularly loved, um, I discovered that I had a copy of her very first pamphlet from Mandeville Press published in 1980 something, 1981 or 82, called Letting, in the, Letting the Dark Through. And it was um, a pamphlet that I cherished at the time and had shelved um, and had forgotten about. Um, and seeing them all together, I realized that uh, she was a wonderful poet whose lifespan was slightly longer than mine. It's possible to be a new poet at any age. Um, one of my very favorite new poets uh, added to our list um, a couple of years ago is Miles Burroughs, who turns out to have published his first book in 1960 something and then uh, fallen, not silent, but fallen very busy in life and have returned as it were to poetic life uh, with, uh, with, with a Carcanet book at that time. So it's always a joy to find poets who are slightly older than I am, much, much wiser than I am, who have a body of work which is uh, discreet, if you like. It's, it's been winnowed by time. Um, and we're publishing uh, Jenny's first uh, book of poems, which is also a collected poems, uh, in, the, in the coming months. When I heard her read, the, one, the poem that first simply staggered me was a poem called Milk. Um, she was born in the Blitz, as I say, and this, this poem evoked the period and the evolution in the child's mind to the young adult's mind to the adult's mind of milk, the language associated with it. Uh, it's obviously nurturing qualities, but also it's cultural qualities, a, a wonderful poem. And then a poem that she read, which was much more recent when she moved from the family house in, in Sheffield to um, a flat called Moving Day, leaving uh, a full scale life, uh, the, the home where her family had grown up and so on with her, her husband, a medieval historian, uh, to, um, to this flat, which is a whole new world. There's no regret in the poem, which is rather wonderful. There's a, there's a good deal of history in it, but no regret. And there's this wonderful sense of looking forward. There's a great positivity about the poem. And then a poem which she, um, which, which she was surprised by herself. Uh, it begins with the line, were there trams in Odessa? And uh, it's a poem which was picked up by the BBC and which, um, which was, was very beautiful. Um, and uh, I, I very much hope she's going to read it, but I can't, I can't tell you if she is because I haven't seen her selection. Anyway, um, Jenny is 
one of those poets who really thrills you. you. When you find young poets that thrill you, you never know where they're going. But here's a poet who thrills me uh, because she has been to so many places and she is still going to other places and discovering new things. So may I hand over to you, Jenny, and uh, welcome aboard. Thank you, Michael. Um, I seem to be a small person in a corner. Not sure that that's quite what's intended. Um, the first poem I'm going to read is Walking Through Slack. Now, Slack is the village at the top of the drive. If you've been to the Arvon Centre at Lumbank, you go up the drive, you turn left, and that is the village you come to. Walking through Slack. The village street tips me out into hills. I watch the clouds canter on slopes far off, on crests of the grassy mountains. The midday peace is warm and edible. Slackening pace at the lane's top, I see the circle of the world. Wonderful, the great presences of land the sun is making play with, and wonderful in the mind how thoughts that lay like stones in a dark landscape, moving at last, prepare themselves for speech. And my second poem is indeed Milk, which Michael has just referred to. When you go back as far as I do, you can remember these things. Milk. War's end. We were resuming in a shadowy world the burden of peace. Patiently, patiently beginning. Outside the infant's dining hall, two air raid shelter humps. Haunted, they said, resembled graves. Milk white among dampness waited for playtime. Job's dairy, the bottle told me, a patriarch, unseen in early morning, clattering to school with rough crates, tangling his windy beard. Then a first hapeth of learning took hold of me. It was, it was a job, like a job. It was something simple, you get up and do. War finished, you begin on peace like a favorite pudding. Later, I was told, no, it was Job. Peace, harsh on the tongue, chewy and difficult, was cold and necessary, like milk. Single planes overhead at night, droned like speeches. Through lanes at evening, went canvassers foraging for votes. Milk day by day appearing, washed into us by ounces, knowledge of the new world and its ways. At our next school, quiet men from big new dairies made the deliveries, anxious about their rent. The next poem is, a, if you like, a holiday poem. Sardinia, moored boats. That man and wife who kiss out in the sea between the moored boats are German, it appears. Her black Babylonian cap describes her as a thriving dress shop owner. They swim about together. Walking on sand, he shows a heavy figure. She smiles at him, fair-haired on land, and buoys him up. Afternoon wind. The wind of afternoon shivers the trees. Think of it as a brown goat, hot, small, distant, picking its way over dry country. Think of it as a fish slipping through clearness 
tossing water in swift glides. Think of it in winter as a coach rocking through mountains black with rain. The um, next poem is about the two of us and uh, having been married for rather a long time. But it also goes back to my mother and uh, I hope you will understand the gesture. Signal. Before the days of texting, here's my mother leaning across the sink to tap the window at my father weeding. She places one index finger across the other, T. Looking up, he waves, turns to survey his work, then parks the hoe. She fills the pot, carries the tray through. The nestlings gape, the ladybird spotted badge. Give meaning without words. The tulip offers its stripy bugle. Yellow flowers crimp the forsythia. Under the little bridge, small dappled fish declare themselves as gravel. The lonely man hang gliding over Stanage Edge feels what the winds tell as they clear the ridge. Now, after so long, you and I find ourselves humming tunes the other started in a different room, or guessing thoughts from a slight inflection, look or trick of the eye, invited to tweetle when tea's ready, I ollie ollie, the old cam races cry, to call my cock steep in 12th century rivalry from his books. And finally, I'm going to read Moving Day. Um, this has become the title poem of my collection, which I'm happy to say uh, Michael is going to produce in May. Um, I mean, he's going to facilitate and Carcanet is going to produce. Um, we'd lived in our four bedroom house for nearly 50 years, bringing up the family, as Michael says there. So quite a change to move a couple of miles to a second floor flat. Moving day. One, two, three and we vault across the valley and land here in another postcode where a squirrel fossicks in the rain on the moss lumpy roof of now our garage. And the back of my mind says, when we get home, but we are home, we wake to a mild damp day and walls of boxes Oddments which can't be returned to drawers, which are ours no longer. The unencumbered squirrel sits on its haunches and enjoys the air. We are in the sky, living among treetops in the region fir cones drop from. Out of the window, we sense the passing traffic of radio waves. The future, crouching in the valley, opens its arms as the sun rises, and the row of pines retract their shadows and whisper of possibilities. We empty and stow, fight through our box walls like prisoners digging a way out. Evening comes, morning comes, the fourth day. Birds look in at us from their neighbourly branches. We are here for keeps. Day passes. Far down the valley, an owl couches his soft note 
on silence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful to hear. Great, great to hear those poems, Jenny. Thank you. I think we're, uh, we're all resurrecting, aren't we now? Thank you very much, Jenny. That was yes. Nice. We're going to be appear, appearing out of the darkness. Um, we we thought we might maybe ask each of you um, if you if you if you had a a couple of questions about the poems appearing in the anthology, and I'm going to start by. Um, taking my cue from um, Jenny's poem about moving day and about what it feels like to house your poems together as a new group in the anthology and what it felt like rather than having the individual poems or what, what about putting them all together in this way and did it make you see your work differently? Jennifer, can I, I, I think you're unmuted, so I'm going to pick on you first of all. <laughs> Wasn't sure if we could just jump in. Um, yeah, it was it was a strange experience because, you know, I write a lot about Cornwall and the sea, but some of these poems are completely different to that. And having them together for me seemed strange. And I thought, oh, well, you know, why are they together? And then as I was preparing for this event, I was looking through them and reading. And I realised that actually, even though the ones that aren't about Cornwall and the sea, they have an effect on the other. And there was some pull of perhaps or something about the R and LI in a different one. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm actually writing above all these different levels. Um, and they all sort of interact somehow. So it was a learning experience for me to see them put together, I think, by someone else. Perhaps what I wouldn't have chosen. Mm. J Joseph? Yeah, I was thinking um, how much I I kind of agreed with that. I think um, something that's been really, really like special to be involved with it is to, is to almost like having a, another eye or the sense of that this this present, form of presenting some work actually helps help for me the process of coming to see continuities in in work that I perhaps formerly thought of as too too split off you know or too disparate and that's had a knock-on consequence for actually you know the way I think about stuff I write more widely so that's been really really um fantastic and it's also just great to have to think about poems in a in you know that's how I naturally kind of want to think about about pieces of work I suppose and about clusters of work and and then uh, whole books or whole um yeah whole works that there's a kind of narrative or a or a, a cohesion to them and so having to think in that way for for the for the anthology was really pretty rewarding do, do you think that the cohesion you're looking for is in a sense a kind of falsification of the individual pieces the only reason i ask this is that there's a wonderful phrase that thomas hardy uses about putting together his books he he calls them unadjusted impressions in other words the, you you read a funny poem followed by a very melancholy poem followed by a satirical poem and there's no attempt to as it were smooth out the or or or, or organize it to affect the reader they're basically the poems stand there each poem is a single poem mm. and i think this, there's, there's a kind of pressure on the contemporary poet to make a book and a book is mm. something quite different from the from, from its parts whereas i think you know books are often made up of their parts and uh, it's an anthology if you like um i, I, I felt this in, re in reading jenny's poems that they each one was a fresh start um and though there are common themes and shared shared approaches and indeed shared phrases sometimes um what is wonderful is that the, the reader is making the construction rather than the writer making the construction for you i don't know jenny did you feel this when you were writing that that you were putting it together in some way um Yes, I mean it, it's always interesting when you when you do try to combine poems into a group. I find um, you, you look at them and you think, "Oh, well, I'll arrange them." I'm, I'm thinking particularly if uh, if you've put poems together, put a pamphlet or something like that, uh, and you arrange them one way round, and and they seem to follow a certain theme, and then you you catch hold of some other kind of link, and you rearrange them perhaps a quite different way round, and uh, the emphasis can be um, quite separate. Um, but yes, I mean, they certainly influence one another in a sense. Um, 
And although at the time you think each poem is quite different from the one before, at least mm. in my case, you sometimes feel you're writing the same poem again, but usually you think it's different. Nevertheless, they, they do make a group together, some sense or another. And I think for my experience, I'm just going to... Um, you know, recall my own experience of putting the poems together that, that I always think that poet's voice and the form that we write in, that's the whole aspect of cohesion for me. I think mm -hmm. that's how I view of my poetry as a continuous, um, you know, experiences that comes in different framework, but they're also, you know, building, you know, in, in essence, they are narrating something that is, um, you know, naturally in, in by memory or things that that I could think of, and um, and, and the, the continuous aspect comes to the poems because their memory is in it to refresh them. It's always every poem is a new fresh, but also it's speaking on something that that it it has a you know a source uh, that's the past of the poet. And uh, for me, I think that that really helps to think of the poems uh, coming to be combined together for an anthology. Yes. I think that's true, isn't it, Michael? And even when we were thinking of how the order of the anthology went and trying to, the voices are so different, but there's such pleasure in moving from one to the other as you're going through a book like this. Um, well, writing though too is, John, um, you've been working with Parwana and we've been reading her poems and working with Jenny's poems, they're completely different. That's why I call the, the anthology New Poetries because there's almost no continuity. I mean, Parwana's work, is is of a piece it's a bit you know in the sense that like Whitman's poetry is of a piece or Lawrence's whereas Jenny's poems are are quite separate and they're quite distinct and though they do as it were exist together and they do talk to each other um it's a different kind of writing and I think Joseph's work too is a different kind of writing <clears throat> Jennifer and Jenny are much more similar in the sense that they're writing discrete poems um and I think possibly uh, I know Joseph is, is trying to to uh, it, it, well, it has actually written a, a coherent um, collection. Parwana is too. It's a it's a different sort of approach, don't you think? Yeah, I think it is. Um, and it, and like you know, we'll see. Um, we hope we will see many books coming out of this. So we'll see extended practice of what's happening um, in the anthology as well. I, I am going to have to at this point introduce my um, launch staple um, uh, here, so it's going to float across. And I'm now going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> about um, about how you have found the online context for poetry over the last um, over the last year, um, whether you've been able to go along to launches or I see Jenny, you're shaking your head already. <laughs> but um, uh, so uh, maybe we'll go the no, other way. Not really. <laughs> Parawana, do you want to start this off and uh, talk a little bit about how it's been treating you? Well, it's 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 quite interesting for me because when we are, we are doing a reading or going somewhere, we are actually entering a different space. But in terms of online reading, you really invite everyone in your space. I think there is a this this gesture of you know welcoming someone and giving them space that you should. They not only experience your poetry, but also entering that private space that you are not otherwise you know sharing yeah. with the bigger public. You know, sometimes it can be overwhelming, but at times it's, um, you know, the technicality of it is a little difficult. If we had done it, you know, a year ago, I think I, I wouldn't be able to do it this comfortably. But, you know, this year we are getting used to it. I'm teaching a lot online and it, it has changed a lot of this, um, our perception of, you know, teaching, our perception of listening and um, understanding ourselves in relation to space is completely different for me. And in terms of poetry, I think I, I really like the fact that it's a moving, moving image. It's a moving tree when you see the poet reading, and especially if you can see the poem and the yeah. poet, you know, in, in juxtaposition. I really like that, that gesture because it helps me to engage with the text as well as with the poet. And I found that sometimes helpful, but it's also overwhelming, right? We, we you know, ultimately we're going to move from this framework to becoming, you know, going to you know, a more interactive aspect of uh, our sort of social life. But, what is but so far... What, what is wonderful is that, Parwana, you, you have invited us into your very attractive space. And it's lovely to see where you're living now, but also you're being visited tonight by people from probably four continents um, from all over the world. And whereas in the past you would have had your warm wine in the corner of a bookshop or something. Here Absolutely. We release yeah, well, 
And I think what gives me a lot more joy is that my family from Kabul also have joined me tonight. So they able to, you know, to see me read my poetry. I think this is the first time they have ever done that. So it's like to see my brothers coming from, you know, Sydney, Vancouver, California, <laughs> and New York, and my parents in Kabul. It's just great. It's just giving them that chance, you know. It's different when you're in a, you know, reading event versus, you know, reading for them personally. I think it, there is a... Um, so yes, that that that's something of a great advantage. But I think there are other things that um, it's it's a little out of space, but also in a different kind of space. So um, it's uh, it's a quite a new experience for me actually. Welcome to the Kabul audience. Yeah. It's the first time we've had a Kabul audience. In Kabul. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, hello. What, how do you, you're, 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 you're a pro at the Zoom readings? Well, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm one of those, I expect there were many, who started the year by not having really ever Zoomed and learning how you sort of got onto it and then gradually uh, acquiring a bit more usefulness with it. Um, I do quite a bit of Zooming now, a sort of conversation with people. Um, but actually, Zoom readings um, are very useful. I mean, I particularly appreciated the poetry business, who can now do Zoom um, workshop sessions with people from Ireland and Scotland mm. and France New and Zealand. all the rest of it. New Zealand, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So for that sort of thing, I think it's terrific. Um, and for readings, yeah, it's lovely that, that uh, Pawana's family from Kabul can join in. Impossible yeah. before. Mm -hmm. Joe and Jenny, do you, we're, we're gonna finish up, I think after this possibly would be, but I wondered if you wanted to say how you found but, this text. Um, I just just sort of added to whatever, what, 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 what Jenny and Pawana have already said, but. I was just thinking just now that I think it's been in a way fantastic for for readers and audiences and 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 maybe maybe sadder for reader for 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 for, for the people giving the the gigs if you know what I mean because I'm just thinking this is the first time I've read mm -hmm. in a zoom context and there's definitely a lot a, there's a strangeness to it you know and a sadness that, that I yeah. can't see the faces that I know and the faces that I don't know um, and and the excitement of that, but as a reader, as a reader of poetry, as a, as an audience member, um, it's one of the few like silver linings of the last twelve months of of misery and and kind of and loneliness in a way. Is actually I've been to so many more readings and I've been to one reading after another that normally would have been impossible to get to, um, and I think that has actually been fantastic. Yeah, I'd agree with that as well. Um, you know, it has to be a positive, and it is, and it's actually been quite a lifeline, I think. You know, just to see faces and people and, you know, to see people across the globe and, you know, to see people at other times of the day as well as being quite reassuring, you know, just virtual living in an algorithm. There are people out there. And I think that's, you know, really, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it has to be a positive, definitely. Very good. Well, um, Michael, I'm going to hand over to you in one minute, but I want to just remind everybody that um, before we thank, I'm going to ask you to thank um, our, our poets tonight, um, but our next reading from um, New Poetries is next, next Thursday, and we're going to be having um, a bunch of Irish poets, and I hope many of you will be able to um, join us, um, and that's going to be with uh, Connor Cleary, Victoria Kennefick, Joe Carrick Varty, Colm Tobin, um, and Padre Gregan. Um, and, you know, the bar has been set high tonight. It's been a real pleasure to hear all of these poems. Um, but please do join us again um, next Thursday. Um, and I know that uh, Jazz is also going to be in touch with you all um, about um, how to pick up copies of the book um, uh, tomorrow uh, by email. Michael? Yes, I just want to say it's, it's thrilling to hear you all. And um, it's thrilling to think that three of the four of you already have books in the schedule, Jenny, uh, Parwana, Joseph, and I hope Jennifer's will be, will be materializing soon as well. Let's, let's have a few more sea accidents and we could have a, we could have an. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, John, too, for, well, thank you for collaborating because this book was, had hit the, had, had hit the reefs, as, as it were, of the, um, of the lockdown. And I was feeling very locked down. And uh, I was unlocked, if, if you like, by John. This was great, a great treat. And we're all about to be unlocked by Jazz, who's, who's the magician behind this all. So Jazz, over to you, <laughs> if you're awake. Yeah, thank you, Jazz. Uh, yes. <laughs> thank you guys so much. This was so good. It's so good that we're launching the book. Oh my God, it's happening. Um, this was the best way to do the first event. Thank you. Um, thanks to everyone who was here and for putting your messages in the chat and stuff. Um, please check your email tomorrow for the link and your discount code. Um, and email me if you can't find it. Buy the book, um, book a ticket to every one of our next events. We're launching until the 18th of March. Um, before then, on Wednesday, uh, next Wednesday on the 24th, we're launching Moya Cannon's Collected Poems. Um, so you should also come to that, uh, but check our website and you can see all the details and how to book everything. So um, I'll probably leave the space open for a couple of minutes so you can like put your final messages in the chat, but I'm gonna turn all of us off now. So um, thank you guys so much for coming and congratulations to you guys for um, being in this amazing new book. Um, thanks, Donna. <laughs>